What is going on, everybody? And welcome into a Thursday, May 13th edition of the Unreasonable Odds podcast. It's a special day. If you're watching on YouTube, you see we have a three-man box. That actually means my co-host, Steve Buchanan, if you want to call him that, is actually here for a show. Um, I feel like this is my own podcast now, but he decided to swing by. And we also decided to bring a guest with us, uh, Scott Seidenberg. You can find him on Twitter, at Scott's on air. Scott, how you doing, man? Thank you for joining us. What's up, the guys? Yeah, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> um, we are mostly going to uh, to cover some MLB today, which is obviously Steve and Scott's wheelhouse, and I'll sit here and look pretty, uh, maybe say a couple of words. I'll close up with some NBA, uh, NBA thoughts before the regular season winds down and we get this cool play-in tournament next week, which uh, hoping we will have a special edition of unreasonable odds on Monday for you touching on that play in round and the playoff matchups in the NBA. But before we get to MLB, we are going to play the game that we have been playing recently with guests called know you better. I remembered it this week. I forgot to do it last week and threw it in, in the middle of the show. We're actually going to <laughs> with it, um, but it's, I, I was the host Steven, in here. So if I want to do things backwards, I can do things backwards. Certainly can. Thank you. Um, Scott, are you ready to play some Know You Better? I hope I am. Good answer. <laughs> um, all right. And with, you don't need to say dollar amounts in here or anything, but just your biggest win and or your most memorable win in your sports betting career. Um, biggest win, most memorable win. Highest I mean, plus odds, however yeah. you want to interpret it. Okay. Um, I did hit an eight-team hockey parlay earlier this season. Um, <laughs> and that was... I don't think you need to go any further. That was, <laughs> it was, not only was it uh, ridiculous, but one of the legs was actually, um, I remember, I think it was, uh, I think it was Detroit. Anyway, the goal was scored with 3.5 seconds left uh, to give me one of the wins. Now, when it's the second win of an eight leg parlay, you don't pay attention to it. Right. When yeah. It's the eighth leg of the eight team parlay. It obviously magnifies everything. And I just remember, uh, you know, screaming at my television, 3.5 seconds left, watching the goal go in um, and being very happy about that. There was an eight team parlay earlier this season. And then I also, there was a, a nine team parlay that I hit. Not I'm He's sorry. He loves you. I, I, this is my guy. <laughs> this is listen. First of all, when you bet a parlay, obviously you're betting within your means, right? It's only a sprinkle. Yeah. It's a little bit here and there. You're not doing a full unit because you're not going to go broke if you keep doing that. But it was not this past NCAA tournament. And obviously last year we didn't have it. It was 2019. In the first round, I had done a, a large parlay. And I do it always for the first two days, first four days, actually, of the NCAA tournament. Because those are the days where you could really predict the winners more. I know there's upsets, but... For the most part, when you're betting the NCAA tournament, right, you're going to pick, like, think about the average person that fills out their brackets. You're going to get 13 out of 16, correct, in terms of just winners. I mean, unless you're really bad at picking these games and you don't know anything about college basketball, you should be able to get at least 10 out of 16 winners. And I know so, plenty about college basketball, and I'm awful at picking this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was fortunate to get a, a parlay there. So those are my two biggest parlay hits. Um in terms of future odds, there's a couple of, uh, you know, NFL draft stuff that I had hit that was pretty good. This past NFL draft, I went very heavy on Waddle over Smith, which made me uh, very happy. I had uh, that one. Yeah, that was one of my that was my biggest liability going into the NFL draft just because of everyone that I talked to was, you know, yeah. it was all Waddle. Um, so that was my biggest liability. So I was very happy about that. But you know what's crazy about sports betting? And you guys know this. We always remember the losses more than the wins. I can't, I, I mean, right now, like I told you, I can't remember what game that was that I won that the eighth leg of that parlay. But I'll tell you right now, I remember pitch by pitch what happened two, three years ago in the worst loss of my betting career. Yeah. When Hold David, it. When, okay. You want we're me getting, to talk about it? Because it, I, I, <laughs> it still gets me. I still <laughs> have pains thinking about the game. <laughs> We will, you're, you're good at this segment. We will, we will get there actually. But before we get to the next question, what kind of, do you remember what kind of plus odds are we talking on this eight and nine leg wins? Oh, it's uh, going to be insane. Yeah. Uh, 13 <laughs> yeah. and thir 1380. And um, the other one was 24 and change. There we go. There All we right. go. 
Steve likes parlays. I love parlays, but they have to end on the same day. I can't do multi-day, you know, BS. They have to be all the same day. I can't sweat, you know, 48 hours at a time. That's not for me. Well, Steve, are you the type of guy also that can only do the same sport parlay? Like, will you do an NBA game with a baseball game with a hockey game? Or will you just only do, you know, three hockey games? One sport, one sport, one only. sport. Okay. Yep. I, you know, see, I like Steve because he's like <laughs> me. We focus on one thing. Give me three baseball games and that's it. We're not cross sporting. That's, that's it. I will tease the Thursday night football game with the Monday night football game and gladly wait for my money. But that is absolutely insane and stupid, but go ahead. You should be locked okay. up in an institution. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, guys. I'll hop in my straight jacket after this. Um, your worst bad beat. Yeah, worst bad beat. Sunday night baseball three years ago, Nationals, Cubs. Uh, Max Scherzer on the mound. Um, I had had a very bad week and yeah. was chasing. And, you, you know, listen, it's, a, it's one of the worst things you can do in sports betting uh, is chase losses. Uh, Scherzer on the hill, Sunday night baseball in Chicago against the Cubs. I am all over the Nationals. It is just, I have just... More liability than I've had in a long time. Scherzer goes eight shutout innings. The Nationals take a 3 nothing lead going into the bottom of the ninth inning. Okay? Oh, no. There are two outs and nobody on base. Hit by pitch. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Man on first. Let's just make the play, see what happens. Single. Okay, single. That's fine. Oh, by, did I mention it was a two-strike single? Two strikes single. Oh, and it was a two strike hit by pitch in the batter before him. So two outs, nobody on, two strikes on the batter, hit by pitch, man on first. Two strikes, one man on first, still a three nothing lead, single, Jason Hayward. Two outs, man on first and second, two strikes, actually it's a three two count on the batter, hit by pitch again. Now the bases are loaded for pinch hitter David Bodie, who gets down to two strikes and hits a walk off grand slam. <laughs> Cubs win 4-3 was this, was this still Scherzer on the mound Or did they go to the closer No, 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 no This was, uh, you know, it was It was not Scherzer on the mound um, This was uh, it wasn't I was going to say, you must know this guy's name You must hate him <laughs> I'm trying to think who the, who the Nationals closer was Three years ago They've gone through a lot Yeah, it could have been it, I don't think it was Doolittle um, And it was, yeah It was literally the worst uh, as you can Google, as I'll Google it right now, David Bodie's walk off grand slam lifts Cubs past Nets. Oh, even <laughs> it, it's even on marquee sports as a Cubs classic. Get to watch guys. Brandon Kinsler. Oh, no okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I know who Brandon Kinsler is. Yep. A ground out, a pop out, a couple of hit by pitches later in a single and Bodie stepped to the plate and quickly fell behind the count. Nationals reliever Ryan Madsen delivered his fifth out uh, offering a fastball to the knees that Bodie was able to get underneath and send the ball into the bushes just over the 400 sign in center field. So it was Ryan Madsen who gave up the home run. And right, Bodie well, has Bodie has 26 career home runs in 281 games. Not a power hitter at all. Unbelievable. And you can imagine the odds, by the way, with oh, yeah. on the mound. Right. And this was yep. this is this is not Scherzer. Granted, we saw Scherzer against the Yankees be old Max Scherzer. Yeah. This was three years ago, Max Scherzer. And that's what the odds were. I still remember that, and it still burns me to this day. <laughs> All right. Well, that is a that is a bad beat. <laughs> um the worst the worst sports betting advice that you feel you've ever given. That I oh the worst sports betting advice I've ever given. Um, Lay it on Max Scherzer that night. Yeah, yeah, probably. No, no. <laughs> it all links back. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? It's the best sports betting advice and the worst sports betting advice that I've given, and I still give it to this day. And it's bet against Jacob Degrom every time he pitches. Again, it's the best, heard a rumor about this. It's the best advice because it's a simple math equation, right? The Mets are going to be minus two hundred plus every time he pitches. Since two thousand eighteen, he has the best ERA in Major League Baseball. Since two thousand eighteen, the Mets have a losing record in his games. 
So it's a great, it's the best betting advice I can give you. It's also the worst betting advice I can give you because you're betting against the greatest pitcher in baseball over the last three years. And you're going to watch these games and you're going to watch the team that you're actually betting on get struck out 12 times and get three (laughs) hits. And you're just hoping to scratch across a a run in the eighth and the ninth against the bullpen. So it's both the best advice and the worst advice I'm giving. Okay, I'm going like to skip that. around here because I feel like it connects. I was going to I was gonna lead. <laughs> so we asked people, are there any trends that you like to follow? And I was going to say, I know you're a fade DeGrom guy. That's kind of yes. a trend that you like to follow. So outside of fading DeGrom, is there anything else like that that jumps out to you that you kind of generally second, ride, even though it doesn't feel right? Yeah, second game of a doubleheader. I'll bet the team that loses in the first game. Always. Okay. I don't I mean, it's, it's one of those auto fires for me it's just it's i it's very hard to sweep a double header the numbers correlate yeah. to that so the team that loses the first game of the double header i always fire on the second game of the double header regardless of the odds all right i like it um usually because you know what happens to a lot of times the team that wins the first game of the double header will sit guys yeah for the second yeah. game of the double header um just to, you know so they get the rest before they play uh the next day especially if they have a game the next day if it's an off right. day the next day then you got to watch the lineups but if they do have a game the next day I'll go and I'll just auto fade the winner of the first game. All right. I like that. Um, The team that you have won the most on the team that you have lost the most on, who can you not stop betting whether you're, you're winning or losing on them? Uh, It's the Mets. I think I've lost the most money betting on the Mets. I don't think I've ever won money betting on the Mets. And it seems when I bet against them, they always rise up to the occasion and win games. Uh, and I'm a Yankee fan. So like this, like burns me, like, you know, like the Mets are like the, just the natural team that I don't like. Uh, and it's not so much that I don't like them. I do want them to do well. I just can't stand their fans. Um, <laughs> we've all encountered those fan bases, but yeah, they burn me every time. It really is strange. Um, they find ways to win when I bet against them. They find ways to lose when I bet on them, which is where the DeGrom fade actually was born from, uh, several years ago when I just decided <laughs> yeah. that I can't trust this team to do anything. So I'm just going to bet against them every time the team that has won me the most money, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. And this isn't just this year. It's ever since they came into the league. So Vegas is like a second home for me. I have family there. Uh, my brother is out there. And when they came into the league, my sister-in-law is Canadian. So uh, my brother is family. They became very entrenched in the Golden Knights. Very big fans of, of the team. Season tickets, all that stuff. And so I was just betting the Golden Knights ever since they came into the league. And what do they do? They go to the Stanley Cup final. <laughs> their first season and I made a lot of profits on the golden Knights that first year. And uh, this year as well, especially on the puck line betting on the golden Knights, they've been very good. Sounds like hockey has been pretty good to you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hockey has been good. And I feel like I should dedicate more time to hockey, but I don't, uh, I kind of, I, I look, I watch a lot of hockey and I, I watch a lot of every sport, but um, baseball and hockey are the two sports that I actually buy the package for, so I can watch every game. Um, I don't do that with the NBA. Um, you know, I don't, I don't get NBA league pass. I, I get, I get the hockey package. I get the, M- the baseball package. So I watch a lot of uh, games and a lot of my handicapping just comes from feel with hockey, as opposed to doing the actual research, which is why I don't really give out hockey plays a lot on Twitter because I don't consider myself a, a hockey expert gambler. It's more of a feel thing for me, just being as a fan watching the games. Whatever works, man. Um, all right. I mean, you passed the test. That was a good segment. Uh, yeah. <laughs> enjoyable. Take your, uh, take your victory lap. Um, all right. So MLB this season, I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I know what's going on. I threw out, I hadn't, I hadn't thrown anything out on Twitter for a while. I threw four first five plays out the other night. I went Oh, two and two. Um, okay. I'm going to stick to NBA. So I'm just going to let you guys talk baseball. I know Steve has some stuff going on and, uh, yeah. wants to talk about that. So go ahead. Scott, so I, the one question I wanted to ask you, because we definitely saw this to start the season, is that um, underdogs were crushing it in the month of April. And I think since May has come around, that's starting to even off a little bit. So now, so far on the season, favorites have, you know, obviously they were always in the lead, but hitting at 55% on the money line, uh, dogs are at 44% now. How much does your strategy in betting 
if it does at all, change from April to May. Because I feel like April is, especially with baseball, because I, I truly feel baseball is by far the hardest sport to bet on. I, I feel like yeah. there's so many variables. You know, we see a lot of underdogs win more often in baseball. But does your strategy change from April to May? Because I feel like we kind of see this trend every season where dogs who we can get at really good prices a lot of times are really the, the bets to make early in the season. And then it kind of levels off as the seasons go on. Do you feel that that's true? And if so, do you kind of change up your strategy as the months start to go on? Well, it is true because at the beginning of the season, we don't know too much about these teams. I mean, there's only so much you can judge by spring training. And I use a lot of spring training to handicap those early games, especially for pitchers. Now yeah. I'm a, I'm a pitcher handicapper. Okay. So when I go and I do these games, I'm really focused on the pitching. Uh, I know some people will throw out, you know, uh, expected runs and all these things, you know, that, that's right. not me. I'm focused on the pitchers, um, which is why I do a lot of first five bets as opposed to full game bets. Yeah. You know, banking on the starting pitching. I don't consider it a strategy to go with dogs versus favorites, but I will say as the season moves along, having more information on these pitchers only helps you when it comes right. to handicapping these games. So in April, it's a lot harder than it is in May. In May, it's going to be harder than it is in June and going forward. The more games right. you have, because then you can look at these starts and you say, Okay, uh, was that outing just an anomaly? You know, did, right. did, like like early on. Okay, Brad Keller from the uh, from the Royals gets rocked in his first start. Okay, and you expect, hey, this guy is going to be an auto fade this year, and then right. he follows up with three really good performances, and all of a sudden right. you're losing because you're betting against him or you're betting the over and it's not hitting. Uh, but now you're getting more games on these pitchers. It's just more information to digest. And I think that's what makes it easier as the season progresses. They always say guys play to the back of their baseball cards, right? Um, I don't necessarily agree with that because each year is different. Each stretch is different. A guy right. could be on a hot streak. You got to ride that hot streak. I could be on a bad streak. You got to ride that bad streak. You can't just go by their averages. So the more information you have on them, to kind of see how they've been the past couple of outings, see how they do against certain teams, see how they do in certain ballparks or in certain roles, right? You know, uh, whether it's on the road or in day games or in night games, things like that always help me as the season progresses. But I don't, ju I don't just automatically go with underdogs early or, or you know, favorites later on. Maybe come September, obviously, sure. have teams that are fighting for playoff positioning versus teams that are out of it. Then you can kind of go favorites and underdogs and just auto-fire on favorites then, but, but not this early. Yeah, I mean, the Red Sox have been one of the most profitable underdog teams so far this season. They're eight and three as underdogs this year, straight up, which is incredible because this team was coming in with little to no expectations, and especially in the AL East. A lot of hype around the Blue Jays, obviously a lot of hype around the Yankees who were scuffling for a while. But at least like for me, you know, I do like trying to take in some of those underdogs. I think there's so much mispricing in the month of April and a lot of what you said is a big reason for that. So like taking a team like the Red Sox, who, you know, especially through the first couple of weeks of the season, we're primarily underdogs. Yeah. There is some exposure and there is some leverage to get in those spots. Well, I, I want to, I, I want to add this. on one, one piece to that question too, because yeah. like, do, do you think that that means like, because the Red Sox are eight and three as underdogs this season, do you think that even means anything as the season goes on? Because we've now learned that the Red Sox are kind of good and those eight and three were basically that like nine game winning streak that they had in the first yeah. 10 days of the season. So does it even mean anything? Because now they're going to be minus right. 130 those yeah. and they were plus 130 and before. Yeah, no, that, to me, it doesn't doesn't mean much their role. To me, it means much their production. The fact that they have, you know, one of the highest runs scored in Major League Baseball means more to me than winning games in, in a certain role. But I've actually thought about th this and, and you can say I'm crazy, but I thought about it. If you were to just say bet on the Orioles every yeah. single game for the right. entire major league season, you would you would turn a profit. And 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 you just look at a team like betting underdogs is the way. That's why that's the whole the whole thing behind the DeGrom fade. Betting underdogs is the way to make money because yeah. you don't have to win much. Like the DeGrom fade is three and three, it's plus three forty one already this season. The Mets can win his next three starts. I'll still be up forty one. Right. You know? and right. So I thought about it with the Orioles, right? Because they were predicted to be one of the worst teams in Major League Baseball. If they go 62 and 100, okay, then, you know, that's a very bad season, okay? But that's still, you would turn a profit. 
you would actually right. turn 20 something thousand profit, uh, 2000 something profit, excuse me, if you're a hundred dollar better on every game. Cause if you look at the average money line against them being plus 150 to plus 200, you're going to make your money over the course of the season. I found it very profitable this year, betting underdogs on the run line. If the juice is not too high, right? If you have a, a big enough dog where the juice on plus a run and a half is under 150. I love those bets. Love them. Absolutely love them because it gives you that wiggle room that they can lose the game and you still win and you're not paying so much. Now, I wouldn't recommend paying minus 200, but if it's minus 150, minus 140, minus 130, even money, I would do it because it's it's baseball is such a weird sport where <laughs> It, it does not matter how good a team is. It does not matter what the record of the team is. What do they say? Momentum's only as good as the next day's starting pitcher, right? Yeah. So you throw a guy out there. John Means comes out there for the Orioles. The Orioles have a, a lineup where you, the only player you know is Trey Mancini, <laughs> and they're going up against the – like they, they could be playing the Dodgers. Who cares? You know, if a pitcher goes and shuts somebody down, you're, they're going to win. Or, yeah. or maybe they go into, you know, extras and don't even get me started on extra innings. Um, but I love that. That's one of my favorite Major League Baseball bets is taking an underdog on the plus one and a half run line. Speaking of uh, of extras, and this is, I also want to get your, your opinions on this one. The over-under has been basically a coin flip all season long. The over has hit 49% on uh on regular games that uh, end in um regulation under is at 50.5 percent for extra inning games the over is hitting at just under 60 percent and obviously you know big reason why man said starting on second mm -hmm. it almost feels like a given at this point if you're right there and this game is going into extras you're most likely hitting the over at this point and the numbers kind of back that up how are you feeling about the over under this year because there's been a lot of talk about hitting across the league down and not just down, down by a lot. Like yeah. a lot of teams are not hitting for power. We have pitchers, relief pitchers that are consistently coming out. Like the average velocity on, on pitches right now, I think it's at like 94 or 95 mm -hmm. miles per hour. Like it's huge. So many teams have guys now that just come out and just naturally throw over a hundred miles an hour. And I have not been doing well on over-unders this year. That's usually my strong point is mm -hmm. over-under on team totals and on games. I've been getting de decimated this year. Maybe that's just me. How are you doing on over unders? And do you think that there is some way to take in that hitting's just down across the league so far this year? Yeah. Well, first off, if you had the under in that Phillies game, Phillies Braves, when Sandoval hit that home run, I just I feel so bad for you because it's a, th <laughs> it's a three one it's a three one game with with two outs in the ninth, and then you know he hits the home run, and next thing you know, it's a the, the score explodes in extra innings. So I, I feel yeah. so bad for you. But we've seen that trend, right? And if you're gonna bet, first of all, you can't bet an under. You cannot bet an under. I don't care about the scoring. You can't bet an under because extra innings is just yeah. going to automatically kill your bet. What you can do is bet a first five under. If you like an under, it's because you like the pitching matchup against the opposing hitting. Right. So why not just go with the first five innings, rely on that handicap, which is the starting pitching against the opposing hitters, very rarely are we handicapping bullpens when it comes to an under, right. right? Maybe when it comes to an over, you're saying, hey, they're going to knock the starter out of the game and the bullpen's giving up, you know, six runs a game. So let's let's bet on the over. You That's the Tigers in a nutshell, right? Yes, yes. the Tigers. Yes. <laughs> so you, you, you can handicap a bullpen when it comes to the over, not when it comes to an under, because an under, you're handicapping the starting pitching. I don't care if Aroldis Chapman hasn't allowed a run. If you're yeah. banking on the Yankees under, it's because of Garrett Cole. You think he's going to go eight shutout innings, right? So forget about the total for the game and focus on the total for the first five innings. I know it's going to be hard when it's a great starting pitching matchup. It's three and a half or, or four. It's very right. low when it's three and a half or even three and DeGrom starts. But DeGrom unders first five are undefeated this year. So keep doing that. But bet on the first five under as opposed to the full game under because extra innings will absolutely burn you. As far as the hitting goes, they, remember – and I don't know if it's being brought up enough. They did doctor the balls this year. Correct. They changed the baseball to reduce the drag. Now, they've said that home run numbers are, are kind of similar, so it hasn't had an effect on home runs. It has had an effect on balls that are borderline home runs. 
right? It doesn't have the effect because they say that, that once this drag effect doesn't take account balls that are hit 350 feet, right? It's a 350 versus 340 is not going to, it's going to make a little bit of a difference, but it will make a difference 290 to 300. OK, sure. That's where the difference is going to come into play. And that's the difference between hitting a home run and not hitting a home run. Right. If you look at a home run, they say it has to have an exit velo of at least 98 with a certain launch angle. You got You have to have that exit velo. If exit velos are a little bit down, even just one mile per hour because of the reduced drag on the baseball, you're going to see less home runs and you're going to see less runs being produced. I don't think it's a situation where you're automatically looking at unders because of the baseball, but it certainly is something to take into effect as to why we're not seeing this automatic, you know, increase in home runs and increase in runs like we saw in previous years. They did attempt to kind of mess with the baseball this year. Yeah, I agree. And obviously, you know, we have no real long data to look at. And this kind of reminds me back when they brought out the, the humidor. And mm -hmm. it started in Arizona and then other parks started kind of getting into that mix. And, you know, nobody really knew what to make of it. And I still feel like, I don't know if I feel like it's made that much of a difference. This, at least in the short term, definitely feels like there's a difference so far because I mean, we've definitely seen, you know, across yeah. the league and, and Blake Snell was very vocal about this, even though Blake Snell is not pitching all that well, but mm -hmm. at least during spring training, he was saying how much he liked the new baseball because he was getting better break on it. He was able to snap it off better. And at least so far as what we've seen, pitching has been the dominant factor in baseball so far. But in baseball, what is this a game of? It's a game of adjustments. Mm -hmm. Pitchers are going to have the upper hand here and the hitters are going to make the adjustment as the season goes along. So I wouldn't be surprised as the season goes along. We start to see these numbers get backed up to where they were because hitters adapt and now they can start hitting the ball again. But at least so far, it's been a coin flip with the over under. Go ahead. Yeah, well, the, the real problem is the shift in baseball. It, it's uh -huh. changed. It's changed the hitters' approach tremendously because yeah, hit, hitters are now being instructed to hit over the shift, right? right? Which is obviously leading to more swings and misses, which is leading to more strikeouts. And the analytics will tell you that a strikeout is worth the same as a flyout, worth worth the same as a ground out. Doesn't matter. So they say a strikeout, who cares? No one cares about strikeouts anymore. Just go out there and try and hit a home run. Try and get it over the shift because you're not going to beat the shift to the sides. So you got to hit it over the infielders and get it into the outfield. That's going to lead to more strikeouts. Um, you're not getting the same home run numbers as you were because of the, the, the reduced drag on the baseballs. And so to me, it's just it all comes down to the shift. But everything kind of relates or correlates, I should say, to, to that adjustment that hitters are trying to make because of it. And in the past, it worked because you swing with that uppercut. You're going to get the home run this year. Yep. It's just not happening as much. Last subject I want to touch upon, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this one, too, is betting at Coors Field. This Rockies team is so unbelievably bad. Yeah. With the pitching and their offense, no Nolan Arenado. So now they really just have what feels like Trevor's story in there. Who doesn't the do anything. Old, exactly. So when you look at the over under in Coors Field so far this season, it's 10, 10, and one. And yet, and even like today, the Reds are in town. The over under in this game is 11 and a half. Mm -hmm. I am consistently betting the under at Coors Field. Just because I do not, I do not feel like this this Rockies team is going to make up the difference for what the away team is going to do. So I've been doing two things: betting the under at Coors Field almost consistently, but taking the over on the team total of the away team. I love that you said because, that <laughs> because that's where that's where the over is going yes. to hit. So I look <laughs> at a total like tonight at eleven, and it's eleven and a half on the DraftKings Sportsbook with Luis Castillo and the Reds. The Reds have been a very good offensive team, but the, the, but the Rockies have not. At what point are the books going to catch up on this? Because I'm shocked that it's 11 and a half for tonight and on, on the DraftKings Sportsbook. That just feels so high for a Colorado team that is one of the worst hitting teams in the league. It just feels like it's because they have the Coors Field name attached to it. It's automatically going to be a double digit over. And yeah. at least for now, it's it's been somewhat profitable to take the under in those games. I, I love that you said the team total on the uh, road team, because that's really where the value is going to come into play here yeah. uh, is betting on the team total. What's interesting is like, I look at first five because I do a lot of first five bets Yeah, and Colorado actually at home is averaging three runs 
per for the first five innings, as opposed yep. to away where it's only one run or one and a half runs. Um, <laughs> so their offense is just very bad. But I would right. look at honestly, like if you look at the Cincinnati Reds, okay, and you want to look at their away total uh, for the season, Big it's difference. Actually, it's very low. They yeah, don't score on the road. Uh, right, it's, just, it's one of those things where they're hitting very. They're one of the best not just f5 they're one of the best scoring teams at home in major league baseball this year but on the f5 they're one of the best teams you know almost five runs um yeah. uh per f5 this year at, at home is just insane i actually think yeah they're the number two team in baseball right now 4.29 runs uh per first five at home but only 1.7 on the road uh it's it's a tough situation because you want to look at the team total going against the rockies but yep. the under, like you said, the full game under, that's the play. Yeah. Because the Rockies don't aren't going to score. The Reds on the road aren't going to score. And if the numbers are going to continue to be Coors Field high, the under is going to be the play. Right. Yep. Unless it goes oh, yeah. to extra, unless it goes to extra innings, and then you're screwed. And then everything, <laughs> and then everything's ruined. Absolutely. Now the, the, the Reds right now averaging um, five point two four runs per game 6.8 at home 3.5 on the road it's amazing massive massive that's yeah. it's a it's incredible but you know obviously great american ballpark obviously a very hitter friendly ballpark but yeah I, I i actually saw that this morning and was shocked at how much of a difference it was mm-hmm. that's a massive massive difference all right julian if you'd like to participate in the in the podcast by all means well so now i want to bet an under on cincinnati colorado tonight i i I feel like you guys both said the full game under is better, but while I was listening, I was like, I feel like I should bet the first five under. Uh, I don't know about the I first d- five under. The only, the only thing that concerns me is Chi Chi Gonzalez right. <laughs> because um, he has the tendency to give up runs <laughs> uh, in his last outing, gave up uh, uh, seven runs in four innings. His inning, his outing before that, he gave up four runs in four innings. The inning, the outing before that, he gave up three runs in five innings. Yeah. Um, Reds' first five is probably the play. How is I was going to say, how has Castillo been lately? I know he got blown up in his first start. And yeah, Castillo is, you know, so last out. Yeah, four runs, three runs, four runs. Both of these guys give up runs. Okay. Yeah. And Castillo hasn't made it out of the fifth. Well, give up runs. So we're betting so. the under. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we're attacking. We're attacking the offenses here um, for the for the game. It could be a situation where the first five over hits and the full game under hits as well. Uh, you might get that situation. Uh, I like. I would rather have. I'd rather back the Reds here. Obviously. I was gonna um, say now I, it sounds. Now it sounds like Reds first five might be a spot. Yeah, that would be where I would look at. Yeah, yes. it's that's where I'd go. I'm not gonna say it's my favorite bet on the board, but um, yeah. I would. That's where I would lean, just because uh, I can't trust Colorado right now. I can't no trust. Way. All right, nope. it's an unreasonable odds <clears throat> consensus play. Reds first five. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm down with that. Yeah, I'll do it. I mean, I'll just do it just to join, just to do it. You know, Put it on the board. I'm, you don't. I'm you don't have to threaten me with a good time. Yeah. All right. Well. <laughs> okay. Great. Because I'm going to bet this. Reds first five uh, minus half a run. It, it is. Um, you want to okay. talk about? You want to talk about uh, inept offenses? The Tampa Bay Rays. I think. I, I think I could get more hits than them right now. And I haven't, you know, seen a fastball since college. Uh, but these. I mean, this is this offense is struggling. Big yeah. time, man. Uh, it's not just the performance the other night, but it's, you know, I, I don't know the last time that they scored more than three runs. Right. Maybe, you yeah. know, two, two, three weeks ago, maybe. I, I don't know. I mean, this is this team is just, wow, they are not scoring. All right. Well, there's another team to fade right there. Tampa and Colorado. <laughs> not yeah. good at hitting baseballs. Um, all right. A couple quick things before we get out of here. I did say I was going to touch on some NBA betting this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday of the end of the regular season is going to be tough. There's going to be a lot of guys out. There's going to be a lot of meaningless games. Um, so you really got to pick your spots on Wednesday. I gave out one of my bigger plays of the NBA season. It was Portland money line at Utah. People are afraid of Utah. The jazz are good. Mm -hmm. No Donovan Mitchell, no Mike Conley. They almost expected to lose that game. They kept it close for a while. Portland blew them out in the, in the second half uh, for the most part, even though it got to seven, I think it landed on that was up at like 16 with, with two minutes to go, something like that. 
Those are the only spots you want to be looking for. I'm not even giving you any particular plays, but those are the spots that you want to be looking for down the stretch of the NBA regular season. The play-in round is going to be fun, and I have some takes on the play-in round. I just want to see that bracket before we uh, before we get there. But like Thursday, for example, I don't necessarily see a spot on this card where one team is absolutely going to be going all out and the other isn't. That's at least in reason in terms of a spread. Like. Memphis should beat uh, Sacramento, but eh. Atlanta should should whoop Orlando, but that's going to be a a monster number to lay. Like we have two great games, Miami against Philly and and Phoenix and Portland. All four of those games, all four of those teams are going to be trying. So those are great games if you have a lean on a team that should win. But like Portland now is on the second night of a road back to back. Phoenix is going to give it a lot more than Utah did last night. I I don't want to go back to the well there. I think on Friday, there's a couple of spots that should line up as, you know, absolute wallopings because one side is trying and one isn't. Wash, uh, Cleveland at Washington. I don't know if Beal's going to be back or not, but Russell Westbrook's been carrying the show. Washington's going to win that game pretty handily. Um, Dallas against Toronto. The Mavericks are still battling to stay out of that play-in line, not let the Lakers, uh, you know, steal their way out of the play-in that should be and toronto's just completely given up um you know you've got like a philly orlando but that's gonna be like a 15 point spread in philly i'm trying to stay away from yeah monster numbers here let me ask you about uh, your opinion because this is one of the things that i love doing in sports and you know i do it in baseball and and whatnot Mm -hmm. i bet against i bet against teams the day after they clinch uh a lot of the times there's celebrations there's you know resting guys there's things like that uh, the Knicks clinched the playoffs last night uh, without playing. Okay. Yeah. They are not in the playing round. They're in the playoffs. They can fight for seeding, right? Tonight they're playing against the Spurs, who are, yes, the second out of a back to back. That's always difficult. Spurs lost to the Nets. The Spurs are not guaranteed. Right. Playoff spot right now. They still need to win to get the 10 seed, the, the last play in spot. The last play in spot. Spurs are five and a half dogs tonight in New York against the Knicks. Are the Spurs a smart play tonight with the points, expecting them to play hard versus the Knicks, who might have had a little celebrating last night? And the Spurs, I believe, this is off the top of my head, I think the Spurs are 22-12-1 and one against the spread on the road this season. They've been one of the best road bets in the NBA. Um, I don't know if I'm going to bet it, but the Spurs would be the side for me. My concern is if the Knicks are locked in enough um, to play for seeding because it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be a big deal, uh, the six versus the five seed. It's basically um, – and you know Miami's going to be trying tonight hosting Philly. Yeah. If you get the six seed, you're playing in Milwaukee to start the playoffs. If you get the five seed, you're playing in Atlanta most likely – um atlanta is more of you if you're the knicks a yeah. team and, and is, there's and there's a shot for the four seed at home court right so uh, you know if you're playing atlanta it's now whether you're home or away it's now a team more on your level it's kind of excited to be there first postseason appearance in a while um whereas if you get on the road at milwaukee uh you're getting a team that's been like favored to go to the nba finals a couple of years yeah, in a row, yeah. even though they're not quite there this year so if I'm the Knicks, I have plenty of motivation to win tonight. I just can't speak to, I don't know, maybe they like, I, so I, I probably won't bet the game. I think the Spurs intrigue me more because they need to win more, but yeah, uh, it's a, it's a weird spot. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, basically over the weekend, you're going to be looking for whether you have a take on a game where, you know, both teams are going to be trying. So you're going to mm-hmm. get all out effort or a team that's just going to blow a, another team out of the water. Um, I think pay goal- attention. Pay attention to the lineups you said because guys could be take guys could be sitting out. And- it's it's gonna be it's gonna be a uh, bloodbath. Respect right now. Respect to the the editors that are gonna be on the DK live feed this weekend wow. because fifteen Sunday games, all thirty teams in action. Last <laughs> season. I don't know who's on. I'm off. I'm so happy I'm off. <laughs> I'm um, off. It's gonna be brutal. Um, but like, yeah, just quickly, I'm looking at like the whole NBA schedule, like. Golden State hosts New Orleans on Friday night. New Orleans is officially now eliminated from playing, I believe, or at least will be by Friday. Golden State's still playing for for seeding. The Warriors at home are going to blow the Pelican, the Zionless Pelicans, out of the water on on Friday night. Um, 
So those are the type of things you want to be looking for in NBA down the stretch. Uh, I, I will say going into this playing round, like we might get a first play in game of Lakers warriors, LeBron and Curry playing for the seven seed in the Western conference. Unbelievable. That will do, that will do higher ratings than, than a first round series. Yep. Then, 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 yeah, that's going to be incredible. Absolutely. Um, and the, I mean, a lot of motivation, like you want to win for the seven seed. It will be, I said this on the game within the game podcast uh, that I do for DraftKings yesterday on Wednesday. If we get that game, whoever loses that game. So the winner gets the seven seed. Whoever loses that game will then play the winner of most likely the Spurs Memphis game for the eight seed. Yeah. Wild. That Warriors Lakers loser is the bet against Memphis <laughs> okay, San okay. Antonio. Yeah, if yeah. anything, you know, they're, that team's going to have help, I would imagine, yeah. from the NBA. They want the Warriors-Lakers <laughs> team in. Not the, I mean, John Morant's great. John Morant's awesome, um, especially if it's the Spurs. Like, that other team is winning, um, and they're going to beat Memphis if it's Memphis. So that's yeah, a spot that I already have lined up for that for that. We, we, call, that, <laughs> we call that the Donahue handicap. Uh, yeah. where you say the NBA, yeah. the NBA wants this team to win. So we call it the Donahue handicap. Yes, correct. We know which way that one's going to go if that spot does wind up presenting itself. Um, all right, real quick before we get out of here, Scott, I know you have uh, some stuff coming up that you want to give a shout out for with our good friends out in Vegas, v Absolutely. I'll be hosting on v uh Monday the 24th, Tuesday the 25th, and Wednesday the 26th. So flying out to Vegas in about two weeks from now. So you make sure you want to tune in uh, VSIN live iHeartRadio, wherever you uh, access VSIN, you want to make sure you tune in. Uh, I'll be hosting with Tim Murray on the nightcap uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night, the 24th, 25th, and 26th. So very excited about that. And yeah, stay tuned to my social media at, at Scott's on air it's right there. My uh, Twitter account <laughs> um, is you can check that out uh, and I'll post everything there. Some picks, some plays as well. Yesterday had a first five inning parlay, which uh, the Phillies Ooh. came through for us. But the Yankees, um, if you played them on the money line, which sometimes, you know, hey, risk the juice. Why not? You pushed and it became just a one team parlay. But the Yankees minus a half on the first five did not come through because obviously it was a zero zero score. Um, and we'll probably work on something for tonight. Uh, there is a lot of one o'clock starts in about 10 minutes or so from now as we're recording this podcast. So people I definitely won't get those. To, uh, the people won't get those, but, uh, <laughs> uh you know, we'll, we'll see about what's happening uh, for, for, better, for better or for worse. They, they're yeah, not get exactly. Those yeah. Um, all right. Well, yeah, you should be excited about that because you're going out to Vegas. Um, I can't wait, man. I can't wait. I haven't been there since before COVID. So it's been a while. Us, either. us too. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, all right, so you're out there all the time. Um, I'm dying for one of those trips. I know Steve is, so eventually when we get there, maybe we'll see you out there. Um, I mean, you would think, I mean, hey, it's it's the parent company now, right? Send you guys out. That's what we're saying. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> tell tell everyone that you think it's a good idea, and we'll, we'll see you out there. <laughs> um, all right, man, Scott Seidenberg. Uh, you can follow him on, uh, as he said, on Twitter, at Scott's on Air on Twitter. Uh, thank you for joining us on Unreasonable Odds, man. Thank you for having me. Anytime, guys. Thanks, dude.